if there's a solution out there that solves your problem, you probably should at least consider using it before trying to build it yourself because the company that did it, that solved it, is 100% focused on solving the problem. And it's not something that they do on their weekends. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 212. Build and release SaaS pricing changes faster with Stig. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your hosts, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Victor, how many times have you tried to create a service for other people to use? Relatively often, mostly because I tend to work for software vendors, which often, not always, create services for others. But not me directly, directly. So So you don't do a lot of those weekend things and side hustles to create the next big thing, personally. But if you did, what do you think it would be? What it would be? You mean the business? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. As the time passes, I think that I would be more and more happy with agriculture as my business, not software. Tell me about it. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. That might be an interesting one to, to talk about in a later episode. But today we have Anton on from Stig. Anton, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And what we're going to be talking about today, and we'll talk about more about Stig and what it does for you. But what we're going to be talking about is what does it take to build a SaaS that is a foundation for other people to build their SaaS, their website, their whatever. It's like inception, SaaS for SaaS for SaaS for SaaS. I imagine there could be many, many layers. Why don't you introduce yourself? In fact, before we start recording, I looked at your last name. It's like, I'm not even going to try it. I'm just going to mess up. So why don't you introduce yourself and give us like just the five second tour of Stig of, of what the problem is trying to solve. And then let's try to break down what does it take to build something like a Stig? Sure. So I'm Anton. My last name is Zagrabelny, which is a Ukrainian. So uh, in case you wondered, Stig basically is a infrastructure for developers and growth teams to release and roll out pricing changes or define their pricing strategies for the first time, or maybe changing them as they roll out and expand. Our current functionality is basically focusing on the entitlement piece, which is somewhat obscure and not so famous around developers. We can elaborate more on that, but basically we help those companies follow best practices when it comes to pricing and packaging and the interconnection between billing and the product itself by providing super intuitive, straightforward tools that you can work with. And once you integrate with them, you don't need to reiterate again as an engineer in order to adapt to new pricing requirements. If you have never had the honor and privilege of building a pricing system for a SaaS, be very happy because it is one of the most laborious and pains in the butt that you will ever do in your life. Maybe next to building a feature flagging system, which to an extent, price books and feature flags all come together. But we can talk more about that later. Let's talk about what is it taking to build this kind of SaaS in 2023, I know how I would have built it back in the 2000s, like the early 2000s, but now 20 years have gone by. What are the pluses and minuses that you're using today to actually build build Stig and, and more importantly, how to operate it? Yeah, actually, that's a good question. Like you mentioned like uh, th- how things looked uh, 20 years ago, but I know how things looked 
maybe 40 or 50 years ago when I, uh, from my experience in the IDF, the Israeli military. So we used like an old equipment and old software stuff, like mainframes and uh, et cetera. But for my modern experiences, uh, I've been in software development more than a decade now. And I guess like 10 years ago, things were a little bit different than how they're done today. You know, SaaS businesses were like more focused on on-prem deployments, custom hardware, custom software, software being delivered, you know, in zip files to customers. That's, that's how I remember that. And like since the revolution and the migration to the cloud and cloud services, I think there's a completely paradigm change in how companies build and deliver software specifically for SaaS. So I think like the main challenge is, is building a system which in our case is an infrastructure APIs, is how you make that, first of all, is highly available and scalable. I think that's, that's the most challenging of things when you start transforming from a POC product into something that is production grade, production ready. And I think also when you build APIs, a tool for developers, you have less room for mistakes. It's, developers are very... If there's something, there's a blind spot that they're figured out in your product, they're going to abuse it. So there's no, no more room for, you know, covering up and you have to make everything right from the first try. Yeah, I think that's the most challenging thing there. And of course, you know, there's uh, so many SaaS tools and services that can help you, you know, to save time and development time when you're building a product because the product usually have like this core domain and there's a lot of supporting domains and you need to go like self-service, like uh, billing, like customer success, customer acquisition, marketing. There's a tool for every department, for every task. And I think there's like a shift between from building what you need into picking what you need, like how you do the shopping, like how you compare those different products. I think it's also like a challenge that I thinking that a lot of companies started to face. You know, there's a, a, there's this whole movement of build versus buy where right now there's a shift to into buy instead of build in order to ship faster. It's like a, a enrichment problems, I think, more than focusing and breaking your head on like how we build this new functionalities rather than which tool we should pick in order to solve this specific problem. It seems like for you, your number one problem is probably availability. Because yeah. being an infrastructure piece for somebody else, you have to keep near 100% or eight nines worth of uptime. Is that a fair statement? Eight nines? Uh, eight nines is really, really challenging, but... Uh, okay, I know. <laughs> I, I'm sort of joking, but but you need to... In, in, in order for your your clients, your customers, to trust using you, you have to keep this insane number up. Right, AWS level type of availability, if you will. Yeah, I think like the standard is four, four to five nines. Yeah, for, if if you're keeping four to five nines, that's okay. That's most people are okay with that. It's always funny though. I'll I'll say this as an aside: people are wanting to build a seven nine application, but they have dependencies on things that are not even three nines. The math doesn't add up. People just don't go there. It's like the weakest link in the chain. It's like the, you know, it's, it, it usually reduces you. If you use a third-party provider that is less than four on five nines, there's no way that you can ensure to be uh, available at four or five nines if that is a mission-critical provider. So how are you going about building out your availability now? Are you running multiple, I'm assuming at least multiple regions within a single hyperscaler, but are you going even beyond that? Yeah, so... Basically, we are big fans of AWS, and we try to leverage as much services as we can that are managed ones. The first thing that we chose to do is to run our infrastructure almost completely serverless, so we don't need to hassle and you know manage manually provision instances or managing upgrades or software upgrades for those instant instances. Switching to serverless, I think, saves you a lot of headache. Specifically in AWS, there's uh, two main services that we use, which is uh, ECS and combined with Fargate, which does this containerization orchestration without requiring you to 
provision EC2 instances in advance and something that they do for you. So it's a real time saver. And they also handle the auto scaling of those instances. So it's basically makes your system easy to scale and you don't need to be afraid of onboarding new customers or big customers with a lot of traffic because you know, like in theoretically you can scale your system infinitely, but there's another service that we also love, which is uh, AWS Lambda. And this is something that we're starting to utilize more and more. Lambdas are a great tool. There's a two families of Lambdas. There's a, the standard AWS Lambda, which is simply a function that allows to run. We basically run containers in those Lambdas, and those are containers probably doing lots of like background and asynchronous jobs. And there's another type of Lambda, which is more interesting, I think, which is the Lambda Edge. And one of our core capabilities, which are the low latency and mission critical services, we try to move to Lambda Edge as much as we can. Lambda Edge allows you, with a click of a button, to deploy your application in more than 200 points of presence uh, that AWS supplies and, uh, and maintains. So basically, you get your API running as close as possible to your users and also respond with the fastest latency you can get. When we decided on this architecture, I think that was one of the fundamental pieces of our architecture is to ensure that if there is a mission for critical data that our customers need to access, it will be served from the edge. Plus, there's the benefits of the availability that AWS provides for this type of instances. And we also use the DynamoDB, which is a great database, especially for you if you want to go into a multi-region setup. They have a nice feature called Global Tables, which allows you also with a click on a button replicate your data across different regions. They also have like this amazing capability of support for multi-writers, so you can basically write into two different regions, and then they get replicated, and they and they do all the conflict resolution for you. So by leveraging those technologies, I think a startup can get to the point where it can handle a large amount of scale, a large amount of requests, and also provide this standard under those high availability requirements to ensure that our customers will suffer the least downtime that AWS can provide. Well, thinking through this, you're talking about the tech of this, but as a global company, I'm sort of peeling back the layers of what does it take to run a SaaS? Now we have all the privacy stuff. You're in the Europe area, so dealing with GDPR is a thing. If you're in the States, there's CCPA and various other acronyms that we won't get into. How do you even factor in for that? Because you know, you're trying to build something that's globally available, highly available, can do things regionally, but now you have to deal with, okay, now I've, I've got it grown big, but now I'm having to shrink it because of government regulations. How, how do you factor that in as you're developing? We tackle this by basically setting the compliance requirements in advance, like from the get-go. I think that's the first thing that we discussed is how important is the customer information to us that is stored by us and how we can make sure that it will be stored in like in its most compliant and safest way uh, and according to all the different regulations. So like the SOC 2 type 2 certification is the first process. I think we started it like in the first six months of the company. It sounds really weird that the startup does that. But we already knew that in advance that some bigger customer, bigger customers of us will require this type of compliance and certifications. So my advice is that to start that early on, and then based on those requirements and this and this criteria, you can build your product in order to comply with all the different regulations and such as the GDPR without tackling that at, at this point where you actually need to scale and you don't have time to deal with this. So if you start with it early on, it's much less of a problem in the future. You mean if you properly plan your product roadmap, you're not going to be chasing that later? Why would you want to do something logical? <laughs> well, yeah. Um, actually, it's an advice that we got from other founders that are in the later stages. And uh, we follow that advice, and it's uh, and it's been uh, fruitful for us. Were those founders also in the we'll call it the infrastructure business, or were they more end user type? 
It varies, but the specific ones were in cybersecurity. So I guess they know what they're talking about. We talked about scaling. You're on AWS. So effectively, you can get anywhere. You're going to the edge in certain scenarios. That way, you're providing a better service to your clients. You've got effectively unlimited data stores with DynamoDB. Do you have any other data stores besides DynamoDB? Have you thought about going back to a relational store or something like that? Yeah, basically we have like our architecture is, is a little bit split into two main APIs. There's like the core API, which does almost everything that related to the user interface into the management side of things, like building the pricing plans, the setting the features, the entitlements, and their main clients is the user interface, which interacts with it. And that API is actually using Aurora Global Database as a, as a SQL database. And from there, we do something like a dual writing, which is means that we also record it in the first primary database, and then we record the the needed information in, in DynamoDB, which then serves the Edge API. That way, there's everything that is not mission to critical is, is not residing in the DynamoDB because DynamoDB is a document database and it's a little bit more challenging, I think, to build applications that are require a lot of entities, a lot of relations. And it's, it's a, a little bit more complex, I think, to model things there. So we basically prefer to, for the the non-critical APIs like to use the relational database. And Dynamo, we use it like as a more of a distributed cache, like in some way, where we only read from that. And we rarely write. It's only for specific use cases. And let's say we have this functionality we call like a building box, basically, of a pricing packaging solution is entitlements and uh, usage tracking or metering. A lot of companies call that uh, that way. Using those two building blocks, you can model pricing and pack uh, or pack it, uh, model your package in a more flexible way than it was possible if, before using these two concepts. Entitlements usually define what customers can use, and usage tracking is like how much of they used of those type of entitlements. It could be features, it could be seats, it could be API calls, it could be anything, any metric. We leverage some of the data is residing in DynamoDB, which is where you need like this fast response times and only recording stuff or reading really fast. So like the usage and the, and the, like the, all the crunch data is already in DynamoDB, but the rest of the application is working with the Aurora uh, SQL database. So you went back through and defined, you talked about metering. Secondly is let's use AWS as the example. If I meter something, that means Okay, I'm making an S3 call. I'm going to pay X amount of money to do a get out of S3. That's meter, right? So they're keeping track of all that. The entitlement thing, again, which you explained, is a little more interesting. That's where if you're in AWS and you, you're not the owner of the account and somebody sets you up to get in there, you only are allowed to see what you're allowed to see. That's the, the effectiveness of entitlements. And no people, not everybody gets to be root. That's critical, though, because if you're building a system, much like what you're building with STIG, this goes back to the availability. If people are relying on you as infrastructure, their clients are doing a pass-through of their system down to STIG to find out what do they have access to to get back up. To actually go, you know, I'm allowed to see this feature, or I'm not allowed to see this feature. And if STIG is not available for whatever reason, then that makes the other people, your clients look bad. So how do people come to you and rely on, on you as their provider of entitlements? Because much like you, you have a dependency on AWS. Again, we were talking about the layers. We've got AWS, of course, how many layers within AWS it is to get to ECS or Fargate or Lambda, you know, what are all those dependencies under that? But you don't care about that because you care about your endpoint you're calling. And then people are calling STIG, and then they, who knows if they're calling anything else. I mean, how do you try to architect it in such a way that your clients never get, mm, they might get upset, but how do you keep them from getting angry? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question. I think a, a lot of like infra pieces or anything related to permissions, I think facing the same problems, the same, cha the same challenges. 
if we take, for example, feature flagging systems, I think there's the same problem with what happens when this feature flagging source of truth API dies. Like what, 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 what would happen to our customers? Which features do, they, do we, they will get? So there are a couple of guardrails we employ and also we've seen that they're employed across the industry. It's basically to try and, and make the, this type of entitlement checks as much as redundant, as redundant as possible. So whenever there's a failure or any catastrophic event that, I don't know, that brings our API down, our customers can continue use and check entitlements without interruption. Or there might be some trade-offs and, you know, in ensuring that the system is operational, but maybe the data won't, won't be up to date as, as the same way as it was in the API, but still you, you can continue to operate your system. So one of the techniques that we employed is basically setting this kind of layers, the same way that we have layers in our API, there's a layers in the SDKs that we provide. So if you employ and use our Stigs SDKs, basically we have this layer type of caching within the SDK itself. One of the techniques that we use is also using like a relay service, which our customers can deploy within their own VPC. And instead of reaching out every time to get, you know, the entitlements usage data from the STIG APIs, you can store it locally within their own VPC. And then in case of any failure, this thing can continue and operate on that local node that will eventually get up to date once there's connectivity is back. So that's effectively a read through cache, if I'm yeah. understanding you correctly. Yep. Okay. <laughs> There's a standalone service which runs that uh, that can self host within your own VPC, which connects to Stig and pulls on that information, uh, all the data that it acquires for the SDKs to continue work properly. And uh, yeah, so basically, it's like a replica of your own data inside your own VPC. So you're you're handling that now. Okay, so this this is interesting. Let's you're able to push that up into the customer's environment. But I heard you say single. Do you make it make that even highly available for them to install within their environment, or does it even matter? It, it, it's a self-hosted process. It's like an image that you can run, but that service is totally stateless. So basically, you can scale it up as well. The only dependency that you need in your own VPC is basically Redis. We use Redis as a store for storing those entitlements and usage data inside the VPC of our customers. But again, this is a more complex deployment that we usually advise only for more bigger customers, enterprise customers. I think for smaller startups, our capabilities of local caching, which means like caching in memory within this DK itself is more than suffice. But for when you start scaling up those instances, those processes that uses our SDK, the cache miss ratio getting higher because there's a lot of instances running at the same time and each, each instance have less coherence with the rest of the instances because memory caches within a single process. So switching over to this type of deployment can also reduce your cache miss ratio and uh, improve your availability in general. So I'm just trying to pull all these things out because... If somebody's sitting at home on a weekend, it's like, hey, I could build X in a weekend. Yeah, you might be able to build it, but you're not going to be able to operate it at the levels that it needs to be created at, correct? Is that really where you're at? Yeah, I think there's this, whenever a company tries to approach this problem space, I think they, uh, it's, it all starts with pricing. Like even before you, we, we talk about this, complex infrastructure piece that requires to serve this type of entitlements and the usage data in order to keep your application up and running and to provide the best experience for your end users. But why you get there? You get there because you want to roll out pricing changes, you know, without making it as a project every time you do a change. I think that this type of changes are something that company faces only when it's starting to grow and starts to scale. Because the initial, like if you go back and take a startup company, startup company at the seed stage and they decide on their first pricing model, the engineers that will be tasked to implement this type of pricing will only see the requirements that they know right now. This is not part of their core product. They see this pricing for the first time. The solution that they will build will probably will be tailored to solve this specific pricing requirements that the company has decided right now, and they might change in a 
month, two or three, but their ability to change that, it will require a lot of effort to do that because they probably just, you know, we're going to release this real fast, support the specific use cases. Oh, we need this type of seed pricing. Okay, we're going to build specific solution for the seed, seed-based pricing. And then later on, down the road, when let's say half, six months, 12 months later, they will figure out that, okay, now they have, we have a customer base and we're selling cheap. Or maybe we got our pricing wrong in the first time. And then we want to reiterate on that. And this reiteration is surprisingly very, very not straightforward. It's something that requires engineering effort and product team effort in order to get it, that, to allow you to modify it and without you know breaking existing customers' plans or subscription or whatever they had. And this leads us to this type of solution of managing the entitlements and the usage allows you to be flexible around how you package things and sell that to your end users. So we ju- we're just like a, a time machine into the future of how would a company will end up managing its own pricing packaging solution. I want to go back into something you were saying there. You were saying when the developers are first starting out, they're working on what's in front of them. Mm-hmm. What were some of the things that weren't in front of you when you were first building this that you wish that were f- with you from the very beginning? Well, basically, the first time I encountered this problem space is when I worked for New Relic. And this is the first time that I actually seen a very complex pricing model for the first time and at scale. It's a big company with a lot of products and uh, each product has its own pricing. And there was a, like a significant change within the company when they changed their pricing model and it took effort. So basically that's, that's the first time that I felt how critical is to have this type of pricing packaging solution or software source of truth maybe. How can it greatly help to introduce this effort whenever you want to do a pricing change? And even not a pricing change, like let's say we developed a new feature and you want to decide under which package we're going to release it, like how we want to price it. Every time you release a new feature, you need to ask yourself, do we give it for free? Do we give how much we pay for it? How much we price for it? How, what's the cost of this feature like behind the scenes on our infrastructure? And all those equations needs to be solved and later on you need to put it somewhere put it in the pricing page put it within your application within your backend service and you need to check if this customer can use this feature and yes or not if it's under its its subscription plan and all those type of questions rise every time all over again whenever a new feature is deployed so yeah i think like this type of problem is something that is rooted in code rather than some think that is a billing problem and uh, that's the approach that we chose to focus on on solving that within the product itself and how those entitlements have been enforced and used to reduce the development development time required in order to keep up with the changes if you were to give a recommendation to someone that's getting ready to build what you've built at stake not they're not going to build pricing but they're they're getting ready to build an infrastructure piece for somebody else what would you say in 2023, where would you start? Assuming that you know what the product is, right? So that's the, you know, we'll, we'll say that as, as the base, because most people don't have their product. They're just dorking around with coming up with an idea, right? Let's assume the idea is fully baked. You've, you've got, I hate this phrase, product market fit. You've got people that are going to pay you money. As the person that's going to be building it, where do you start? I think it's a, it's a very it's a tricky question because it depends on what type of product you're building and who are your customers are. Like if your customers are non-technical people, if you are building a software which is you know basically does some kind of automation or does some ana- data analysis or reporting, it has different requirements and different needs, and there are also probably different solutions for each type of those products. But I think that. The questions that you need to, to ask yourself before you start building it, it's based on my understanding so far, how critical is my system if it's down? How would my customers be angry? At, at which level they would be angry if my system is not available for a few minutes or there was an error or there's an outage? And if the answer is 
they will be so mad that they will leave us and stop being our customers. I think that's where you need to, th to think of how we can make the system highly available and scalable from the get-go when you start building it. And I think the first thing is to check different cloud providers and what they offer. Because every startup in the recent years is basically trying to not reinvent the wheel and use the, as much as existing cloud services that the giants are providing for us, you know, standing on the shoulders of the giants. Because there's, a, there's no way that a team of five, six, seven, eight engineers can build you know, their own infrastructure from scratch, not in a timely manner at least. So I think there's this skill set, again, back, in, back to the start of our conversation of figuring out which tool helps you to get there, which cloud provider you can use, which one that has the most, what has the best tools that suits your needs. And then from there, you can start with a strong platform and build on top of that your own product, your, your own like, core domain. I think what you're saying there is use a service. If, if you know that you have to be highly available because people would stop paying you and they'd leave to go somewhere else or go build their own. You're going to need to pick a service on which to build that can help you scale to that point. That's point A. Point B is you may not be able to write code that is going to work for you from day one. You might be able to model something, but it could be completely throwaway because of your availability requirements. Much like what y'all have done for those really high volume type scenarios, you provide an option to put a Redis-based solution within a customer's VPC to help mitigate, number one, your potential outages, and number two, give them a little bit better latency. Mm -hmm. But I, I have to say with it that we didn't start with that. It's basically, as we saw the need of our customers rises for higher availability requirements, this is something that we added later on. I, we didn't build it from the, from the get-go, but we did focus on how we can make the, the API request be being served as fast as possible. I think that latency was also a critical part in, as part of our solution. Like one of our product offering is basically a set of widgets that allows developers to implement pricing within their application, like the pricing page, also on the public pricing page, also the inner pricing page, the customer portal, all, all those types of widgets uh, that save developers hours, if not days, of work building them themselves. So those widgets are using our consuming our APIs. And one of our concerns were how you can, you know, not improve, not hurting the user experience when using these widgets. So one of the decisions that we made was leveraging this type of edge APIs in order to serve this, this data from there. And that improved our latency and, you know, uh, response time greatly instead of thinking that afterwards, like after we already have customers and they start complaining. So this is maybe some premature optimization, but this type of things that there's a trade-off between if you want to release something fast and get feedback, but you already know that there might be some cases where the, where the feedback might be not so positive. And, but if you can do the, a little bit of, you know, thinking forward and if it does make sense to do that, this is one of the decisions that is worth investing on early on, like thinking how many traffic this API should serve. Like, how can I make sure that it will stand in the scale that we expect? Maybe right now we don't have customers, let's say from day zero, but in a few months ago, even two, three, four customers, how that will work? Because our type of product is also somewhat tied to the volume of the end users of our customers, because those are the ones they're actually using their product. And based on that volume, this is the amount of requests that our API will get. So we had to do some of this two layer calculation in order to understand how we can reduce the workload on our APIs. And that was one of the technologies that we chose eventually, and the edge and leveraging it, 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 it as much as we can. And it paid off. So let's talk about that SDK flow for just a second before we start wrapping up. I'm assuming when you first created the SDKs and you've got a handful of different SDKs, unfortunately, my favorite Java isn't there yet, but that's okay. That's, I, 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 will, I will write it down. 
I saw it was on the list coming soon and that's fine. But let's, let me, let me see if I maybe what's the, what's the opposite of crystal ball. Let me look back on history without knowing the history. Let me be a revisionist history person here. I'm assuming you probably created the SDK and it probably didn't have any cash to begin with. You may not have released that, but that's probably what it was. And then you finally realized, oh, you know what? We don't need to hit API every every time that something's going on. So let's add in a cache in the SDKs to help mitigate some of those. And then you saw the problem started happening, problem, quote unquote, for these really high traffic people. And that's when the Redis-based self-hosted, quote unquote, self-hosted solution was created. Is that pretty much the storyline of how that how the SDK evolved? Well, uh, pretty much, but... Actually, regarding like the uh, the requirements of you know adding the caching to the SDK, I think that thing that this requirement like uh, rose really early on. The first thing that we did, and I think it's a like a good advice to any founder or someone who wants to be a founder, is basically talk to your customers before you s- start the company. One of the things that me and co- my co-founder Dor did is talking to, I think having more than two hundred calls with different personas on this problem space. And one of the feedbacks that we got from engineers were those concerns about the first concerns that we always heard of is what, what happens when you're down? Like what? And now that I use your API on every request that my end user is, is performing, you're adding latency to my own API. How can, you, how can you reduce that? So I think that those things were on our minds from, the, from day zero. And we we just knew that we, that is something that engineers will not forgive us if we won't support that because if they start building it on their own, it's quite complex. Everything that is related to caching is complex. Like there's a, there's the saying, you know, that uh, what's the two hardest things in software engineering is uh, uh, naming things and uh, cache and validation. So cache validation is tough. You, it's it's uh, trying to solve it on your own, especially with a distributed, like in a distributed system, it, it's challenging. And we tried to make the integration with Stig as seamless as possible and to reduce the effort from the engineers. So the cache was born the, very early on in the first days of Stig, I think, in the, fir- the initial version of the SDKs. But but according to the timeline that you described with the Redis caching and a self-hosted solution, yeah, that's something that definitely arose only after dealing with some large-scale customers. Or maybe said differently, large-scale issues. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> large-scale issues. Realistically, you might have seen, because you did come from New Relic, so you were familiar with large-scale issues, but until it actually happens to you, you're like, oh yeah, let me, I'll put that on the list. And maybe it's on the list at the very bottom that you might get to someday when I have time. And then all of a sudden, somebody that's paying you money has this issue and that issue now goes near top. Any other things you want to tell either founders or somebody working on a weekend saying, I can do that in a weekend? Yeah, I think that's, 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 a, that's the, the first thing that we hear like from, you know, when we discuss with engineering teams is that. The way they see the problem space is very, let's say, narrowed down to the requirements that they hear, that they heard, that they have been tasked for. And there's a, let's call it a very deep rabbit hole that you discover only after you start working on something like this. This is a somewhat hybrid product, which is hard to also define the, like, where's the, you know, where's the boundaries? Like, it sits in the product, but it's also talks with billing. So there's like a, there's a entitlement stuff. There's a you know metering, how everything relates one to another, and how you make everything work together. So the first thing is defining lines. I think that's that's the most important thing when you start building something like that. But when you're not aware of the complexity of the of the problem you're trying to solve, you probably build something naive like at the beginning, which will work good. Like it it might be good enough for the first six months, for the tw- first 12 months. But whenever you uh, decide you want to have something more robust, something more adaptive to change, this is where you try to st- 
re-engineer it. This is why where you say, okay, I need to refactor that. And we need, need to change its code. It's not. It's we would never support the requirements I get right now. And this is where we. I think this is where stick comes into play. That we like our our customers basically are the one. There are two types of customers. For the first ones are. They're trying to do their initial pricing for the product. They try to do the builder first, you know, pricing plans, and uh, we can help them get that up to speed with you know the widgets and the, the API and the, the the management user interface and with, with everything and that we provide. And there's another type that ones that started building it as you prescribed over the weekend, and now they're stuck. Now they're nailed down to to the to the capabilities of their own solution. And when the company grows, they understand that maybe they're, you know, leaving money on the table of their existing pricing and want to change it, or maybe change the packaging, you know, break a package into two new packages. And this is where it starts getting tricky because usually those systems are very coupled. Like, I mean, whenever an engineer gets tasked to work on something like this, they try to evaluate billing solutions. They, you know, look at Stripe, look at Chargebee, maybe look at uh, Paddle. And then they try to understand, okay, this is simple. This is the API I need to work with. This is the spreadsheet that I got from my product manager that described how our pricing is going to look like. And then they couple themselves with the billing system, specifically for the spreadsheet that he got at that point of time. And whenever there's a new requirement, this thing needs to be you know, restructured again. And for what we saw in larger companies, where the requirements are a little bit more com- complex, it's, it's, you know, there's a whole like, a team that managed and does this type of changes if the infrastructure is not robust enough. So maybe on a startups, you know, for the day zero, this is something that they won't necessarily need. Like maybe not, at least they don't want to know that they need it, but there's still a lot of work, you know, even synchronizing the, the pricing plans in your application and, you know, the out, like the corporate website, you know, the, the, the Webflow website, whatever, the, the public pricing page. Even synchronizing those two might be challenging Whenever you do a change in one place, you need to go to another one. So if you go for something like Stig, this is, might be a, already a solved problem. And also the integration of billing, it's not so straightforward. Like whenever you start digging deep, you understand there's a like different kind of processes there. There's like a the checkout, there's like the subscription, and there's a subscription lifecycle. And then you figure out, oh, it's not only the hosted checkout page that I need to implement when I site in order to get the to get money from my customers. I also need to start listening to webhooks from Stripe. I also need to propagate changes from Stripe into my own system in order to understand how to gate those features. So this is the whole part that we call provisioning. And it also can get very complex over time. So my advice is, if we go back to the original question, is trying to figure out like if there's a if there's a solution out there that solves your problem, and it, you probably should at least consider using it before trying to build it yourself because the company that did it, that solved it, is 100% focused on solving the problem and it's not something that they do on their weekends. Final question. Does Stig use Stig to build Stig? Yes, definitely. So the first thing that we did is basically model our own pricing within Stig in order to figure out and fill the let's say the pain of our customers on our, by ourselves. And we still use it in order to modify our existing pricing and also managing subscriptions for some of our customers. So yeah. Well, all of Anton's information and information about Stig is going to be down in the show notes. Anton, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox. DevOps Paradox.